Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ron Amlin from SBM St. Louis, and we are honored to have today with us Mark Metz. And uh, I, I refer to Mark as the sales whisperer because he he goes into two companies and works with businesses and helps them not only set up their sales force uh, and, and come up with a sales strategy, but help sales uh, sales staffs when, when they're struggling. Uh, come up with ways to uh, to recharge their their sales efforts, and he's he's president of Optimus Sales Group, and he's also a member of, member of Sales Acceleration Team of the Sales Acceleration Team. Um, Mark, let's start out. Tell us, you know, tell us your background, how you got involved in uh, coaching of of sales, and uh, and how you help uh, businesses. Sure. So, you know, it started quite a few years ago. <laughs> I'm actually an electrical engineer out of school. Um, first, I worked at uh, McDonnell Douglas at McAuto while I was going to school, and then I went over to Ralston Purina, finished my schooling at night there um, in the engineering department, automating factories and doing things like that as a controls engineer. Did that for about three years and was traveling so much, it just got to be too much. Uh, small company, well, they're not small anymore, but Alvey Conveyor here in town, spent a couple of years there, and then the company that actually made the computers uh, recruited me, the industrial automation computers. So the things that actually controlled that we would program that controlled the automation for the factories. Um, they called me and said, hey, we've got a guy leaving. He's going to Sandia Labs. We need to backfill him. He recommended you. I'm like, yeah, that might be good because I was traveling quite a bit with uh, with the Alvi people as well. And, and I said, well, that might be interesting. So I got on with them as an app engineer and did that for a couple of years. And that's where I met tons of clients. I mean, I was working with people like Amron and even Ralston, you know, P&G, just all kinds of companies that used our products back then. And after a couple of years of the app engineering thing, this was probably, I'm dating myself, probably 87, 88, uh, the, 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 the district manager came in and said, hey, he said, we've got a guy, one of our sales guys is promoted and he's heading back to Andover to uh, corporate. We want to move into sales. And I'm like, why would I want to do that, Harold? That's salespeople are horrible. <laughs> you know, I had that connotation. And he goes, oh, you'll make a lot more money and you'll have a lot more freedom. And I said, oh, you just had just money was good enough. Well, let's try this. And and what was funny about it, I didn't really change my what I did. I just went in and solved my customers' problems and ended up setting a sales record. I, I sold four and a half million dollars worth of product. My number was a million and a half back then. And they said, oh, since you started in July, how about if you just do 750? And I did four and a half million. <laughs> It was funny, but it was, a, it was a blast. I mean, all the customers, you know, I mean, I just went into some problems, you know, before all that solution selling even came about, I was doing it just because that's what I did. I didn't want to be a salesman per se. So just found out, you know, kind of by the by the luck of the draw, that was the right thing to do. Customers, really, you know, really reacted to that. So I did that for about three years and they promoted me a district manager position and went up to regional and all of this and just kept growing in the company. But in 95, they got sold really a student of sales at that point I really was buying into this whole thing of just solve problems right so that was kind of my mantra I got bought out by square d promoted to regional guy my numbers went up everything went up and my overall pay went down and i'm like yeah, I'll give this a try all we did was go back to chicago to have meetings about when the next meeting was it was a bunch of cover your ear and stuff and that's just not my world i don't i, I want to get things done so I actually started my own company here in, in town uh, called Synergy Automation, where we were a distributor for automation products. And I ended up getting the number one machine HMI software. It was a software for manufacturing in the world. They liked my model and they said, hey, would you sell our stuff? I'm like, sure, I'll focus on that. That'll be the, the leader of, of, of the company for me. Did that for 10 years and uh, watched them do a couple changes. You know how corporates, people get bought sure. all the time. <laughs> When 2005, I was a distributor of the year in 2004 and 2005, they got bought out again. And a new team came in and their model was, we got to have the big boys, you know, $3 million in sales. You're just a couple of states and you're just, two, well, not even like half of two states, you know. And he goes, oh, you're just not what it takes. And I'm like, well, I know how to sell your stuff. Well, you just don't have really what it takes. They didn't care. They just wanted the big boys in there. So I sold in 05. What I what I learned through that whole process was building from scratch. How do you do? It? How do you get them motivated? How do you keep them on board? How do you keep a solid sales process? Keep things fresh. 
Um, so what I did then was I just went to some engineering companies around town here that consulted the engineering services for those companies, you know, for automation, help them build their sales teams. What I was finding, I guess getting older, I was getting a little bit of ADD going on. I'd do that for a year or two and I'd get everything kind of fixed and running really well and I'd start getting bored. I'm like, I gotta find something new. I gotta find new challenges. This is I've got to look now, let's move on. So I did that like four times in the next ten years. And uh and after the last one, I stayed there for quite a while and built a new process and everything for them, got some nice things rolling for them. And I was like, what is my next step? What am I gonna do? So I just did some full searching and I'm sorry, my mic. I can't, yeah, I can hear you. Did some soul searching and uh, thought, well, you know what? I'm not the corporate guy anymore. I, I just want to move too fast. My father owned a small business. I grew up inside of a small business. I watched how he did things, which I think helped me a lot uh, uh, as, as well. And just kind of took over and just said, I want to help companies. I want to help small companies that struggle with building sales teams. And all the information and knowledge that I've learned over the last 30 years, I can help people with that. So that's what I've been doing, and it's been an absolute blast. That's awesome. You know, when when we think about managing a sales force, and I'm I'm a sales uh, sales guy who who then became a sales manager. It's difficult because uh, you know people don't understand sales uh, sales, and, and they don't understand salespeople, and then yet they have to manage them. Um, right. to take me through some tips and strategies, particularly in in this new normal, on, on how to uh, to really manage uh, a sales team. What's well, more important than ever to have a really solid sales plan, really understand what tools you have. And then I, I'm a Sun Tzu guy, which most people won't remember who he is, but the old Sun Tzu art of war weaponized those tools to take to the market. But it's really about educating the customer. I've never been a proponent of, oh, use this closing technique. No, no, absolutely. Run. When you hear oh, what closing technique, just run. Right, right. Because that's not what you do. You educate until the customer decides to buy solve their problems, focus on them. You know, another big proponent of uh, Donald Miller's work, and he's the story brand guy. You're probably familiar with that. Mm -hmm. I love what they do because they say, focus on the customer. And I used to do that too. It's just another thing I did. I told, we're going to a customer, and like, oh, this is a great concept. Would you help me take it back to my boss and the company? We're gonna, we're gonna go with it. Like, no, I don't wanna do that. I want you to be the hero. I'm your guy to help you do that. I'm just helping you do this. I want you to get the credit paid in dividends because these guys would rise through the ranks and next thing you know they're plant man and they're bringing me in you know and i just whatever you say that's we're good i'm like awesome you know but so that that kind of technique and those things but in the new normal you know i've been struggling and i've got i've had a few clients still i thank god they held on they're in a good spot you know and uh we've really been working with the videos right i mean the, some customers resist zoom meetings so what we've done, and this is just a free tip. I mean, it works. I think we've had some pretty good success. Use something like Loom, where you can actually record a 30 second, one minute customized, you know, personal video for your client that you're trying to reach out to. And you embed that in your email where they can watch it and they still see your face because you still want to build that familiarity. You want to be in front of that person and it's as personal as we can get without actually being there. So until we can go back and some places we're getting out again, you know, and we're getting to see people, which is number one. But if you can't right. do that, it's not as important that we see their face like in a Zoom meeting, like what you and I are doing. It's more important that they see our face to maintain that trust and keep that connection. That's the key. So in this time and then the other thing that I've, I've, I've talked to some clients about doing and some of them have done it. You know, we got to change the comp structure a little bit because things are down. We got to really think about our model. You know, I had one guy says, I really, really feel for the sales team. They're kind of hamstrung right now. I said, well, pay them, give them a bonus. It may not be their full, but give them something. You know, he said, well, none of them are, I said, that's not, do you want to keep these people? He goes, yes. I said, cause I'll tell you straight up in my world, I get a lot of sales people come to me saying, Hey, do you know anything out there? Because they know what I do. You know, like a lot of sales people are getting frustrated because it's really it hurt their income, but Think about it's investment, right? I mean, you're not giving them anything. You're you're just keeping them going for this time. You know, we can talk about coming out the other side later, but just help them out. And, and some of them have done it, and it's worked out very well. Otherwise, it's more just about, hey, you know, if we, we really appreciate what you're doing. You're sticking by us. We're going to stick by you. Is there anything? It's just 
be, 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 be real with your salespeople. You know, salespeople really want to understand that they are helping. And that's another thing that I preach a lot about is called sales culture, right? I mean, you don't want to, I've actually turned down some clients that say, oh, those salespeople, you know, they just, they really don't do much and we got to pay them all this money. And I'm like, you have no clue <laughs> what it's like. Right, you know, right. When I moved from my application engineering into sales, my world was rocked because when I was an app engineer, every customer wanted to see me because I was an app engineer. When I'm a sales guy, they start pulling back. They're like, what's he going to try to sell me? And, but I didn't take the approach, which helped, but I still had to get over that hurdle. And it was a shock. So sales is tough because you have to figure out how to get people to want to talk to you and to see you. And that's some other stuff that I do to help. I mean, we build through the story branding, some of the concepts. I'm not a story brand guy at all. There are people here in town. If you want to look into that, read the book. It's a great book. But uh, I try to help with that and build what I call a sales story from another great sales guy here in St. Louis. Uh, but he's kind of global. He doesn't stick around here much. Um, but he has been called a sales story. And I've, I've always done it, but I, he really honed it in with his concepts where we actually flip the script and the salesperson says, man, look at all the things. And it's about focusing on the customer and how we help the customer. And here's the things that we can do for you, Mr. Customer. And when they read that, we don't give it to customers. We just internalize it. They that, they're like, man, this person really should talk to me because I can help them. And I can do good things and I can make their life better, which is really the key here, you know, to sales of any kind. And right, right. If the salesperson understands that, then all of a sudden their desire flips. I can flip in the script from, yeah, I'm going to call these guys and bug them until somebody just capitulates and talks to me. No, no, no. You want them to talk to you because you're going to be able to help them. You have true, real, real value that you can help that person, help him have less stress at work or whatever it is. But that's what we want to talk about. And that's the sales process. And that's become more, more prevalent now, actually, because of the higher levels of stress and things. You know, if we can become their easy button, which is way overused, but it's kind of true. And hey, how do I help you, Mr. Customers? Anything I can do for you? And sometimes it's not even related to what you do, right? I mean, I've done silly things for customers before that have nothing to do with what I'm selling just to help right, them out right. personally, you know, so you got to build that trust. And that's, that's, that's part of it. Let me ask you this from, from a guy who's a sales manager to, to speaking to the sales guru. When I think about sales, I think about, I think about it like uh, someone's trying to lose weight, right? So like if, if I'm 180 pounds and I need to be 170, so I need to lose 10 pounds. So, so how am I going to lose that 10 pounds? Well, it's really going to matter. The, the numbers themselves, 170 pounds, my goal weight, really is just a number. And, I, you know, that, that's just not magically going to happen if I stick it on a board every day and try to make it happen. So so what, what's, what am I going to do to make that number happen? So it, it's the activities and the drivers that are really going to make that number happen. So if I'm trying to lose 10 pounds, like every day I need to eat a 1,200-calorie diet, right? And then every day I need to go to the gym for an hour. And, and the more focused and disciplined I am on these activities, the easier it will be for me to get to 170. And I, I think a lot about that when I think about sales, because I think a lot of poor performing salespeople just are not doing the activities that they need to do to be right. successful. And I think when I was a sales manager earlier in my career, I was so focused on that number and we would meet, I would meet with my sales reps and it would be that number, that number, that number, that number. But we never talked about the, the activities right. and the things right. they needed to do to get that number. What, right. what is your uh, philosophy on that? Do, do you think that, do you agree with that, that it's, it's the sales activities mm -hmm. for poor performing salespeople that just aren't happening? Right. And, right. So you're spot on. I mean, I, when I had that really successful year, the next year I focused on the money. <laughs> I, was tanked. I really did. I was plummeting and thank goodness I had enough self-awareness, whatever you call it, where I'm like, I kind of assessed what was happening. I'm like, dude, you know, you went from doing the right things for the right reason and not worrying about money to worrying about money and just totally stepping in it because customers can sniff that out. They'll smell that from a mile away. So you have to focus. And I, did a blog about this a couple of years ago. You got to focus on the daily work is what I call it. And you've got to do the daily work with discipline, knowing that if you do these things, the, the right, the things will happen. The money's going to come, the sales will come. 
But what you have to do is you got to be kind of smart about it. So what I have the people do is start with your number, like you said, like this number at the end of the year, whatever it is, 1.5 million. Don't care. Then what do I have to do? What kind of activities do I need to do monthly or quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily to get boil it down to your daily task and, and, and get that and start working that? I'm going to do three lunch and learns a month, one every month uh, in a quarter. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, and. And an EOS principle, which is another great program out there, the day the ninety day rocks. You know their their principle. Your mind can focus on something for ninety days before you kind of drift. So I kind of that's why I always bring up the quarterly thing. Do do quarterly goals because you can focus on those. But what you have to do is just because you set those doesn't mean they're the right activities. I'm working with a company and a product right now that <laughs> measures those things well. It'll tell you, oh, I'm 105% of plan on my activities, but my numbers are down. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's go back in and look at the activities. What are you doing? Maybe those aren't right. Okay. Right. And then you might have another team that's 80% on the activities, but 120% of plan. Well, right, know. right. And so you got to figure that out. So, you know, no plan is perfect. Everything needs to be with the living document concept. Keep looking, keep, but it's got to measure it. You know, that was that's a big deal. So that's why I always recommend if you don't have a CRM, please get one. There's some easy ones out there. Reach out. I'll help you. You know, it's just it's just part of it. But please don't look at the CRM as the catch all be all end all because it's not going to do that. for you. All it is is a tool. It's just like a hammer. And if you don't have a good plan and the right material and everything like that, all you're going to do is be beating on things and it just ain't going to work. So those are the things that I recommend. But you're spot on. You focus on the daily work and have that discipline you know and i tell people i tell this to teams all the time you know you're pretty tired and you, you're two calls shy it's 4 30 quarter to five oh, it it up and make those calls because a lot of the important people they're trying to get to are still working 4 35 5 30 or at 7 30. i've had some of my best sales outcomes when I call somebody at five o'clock in the evening thinking, man, you know, I had a guy, it was a long story, but I mean, I literally got a lead. I called this person. He said, how about meet me at 4.30 on Friday afternoon? He, was, he wanted to know. And I'm like, sure, Bill. And it was the old Purina Mills here in St. Louis. And I should, I, he said, where do you live? I said, oh, I'm over by Edwardsville. He goes, well, I said, if you want to meet at 4.30 on Friday, I'm there. That doesn't matter. And we went over and they ended up standardizing on my software. And it was a great opportunity for both of us. We had a great time. And uh, but that's how it works. If I said, wait a minute, 430 on Friday, I, I got to be out. I got I'm going to do something. Heck no. You know, the customer focus on the customer, take care of their needs and, and everything else will come out. OK. And, and motivating salespeople is, a, is also a really important thing for sales managers. And I have a sales manager friend who who had who, who meets once a month. He, he, he actually manages several salespeople, but he meets once a month with every salesperson. And, and so they'll, they'll sit down and they'll go over uh, uh, this month's report, right? They'll go over this month's sales and, and they'll, he'll see how the, his, his salesperson is doing. And then after they do that, they'll go through the pipeline. So, so you know, he'll look at, you know, where you're at as far as right. the upcoming month. And then he gets a pretty good idea. And if, and if those two things aren't doing well, Right. Then the third step is they'll they'll look at activities and yep. he'll he, and and he doesn't start with activities first because salespeople don't want to be micromanaged. So right. so if you go at him like how many calls did you make yesterday? And his philosophy is he has some salespeople. In fact, he had one guy that came up to him and and, he, and this guy was from New York and he was a New York Giants fan <laughs> growing up. And apparently under uh, uh, the, the years in the I think uh, 80s when they were winning the the Super Bowls and stuff, uh, they they had a field goal kicker and he. He didn't want to come to practice. And so he came up to the coach one day and he said, listen, if I kick all my kicks in practice or in the games, how about we make a deal and I don't have to come to practice? And the coach who was Bill Parcells uh, said, OK, I got no problem with that. As long as you make your kicks, I don't care if I see you all day. So my buddy who's, who's a salesman, he has one or two employees that, that are like that, that don't want to meet monthly. And his philosophy is if you're making your numbers and you're right. one or two on my list, or even three or four out of my 30, I'm good. I mean, I, I don't have to see you. We never have to speak. Right. But if, if you that. fall, if you fall on my board past like five or six, then we're going to meet and right. we're going to go over where you're at. Um, so, so tell me about the, that your philosophy on, on, on meeting with salespeople and trying to motivate them 
or get them from being number 20 on the list to number five on the list. Okay. Uh, there's two philosophies there. One of them is how much time. So I've, you know, the old way, I guess, is how much time do you really want to spend with your, if you've got 20 people, how much time do you really want to spend with 17, 18, 19, 20? Do they have the capability, right? Butts, right seats. Do you, do they do they? So you work with them, but you really what you want to do is protect the top ten, the top eight, whatever it is, and really give them the resources they need to excel and to maintain and to grow. Make sure they're happy because those are the ones you really don't want to lose. So right, I had sales right. managers in the old days or back when oh, I'm going to spend all my time with these underperformers. Eh, maybe not, right? I mean, you just got to think about that. You do want to work with them and help them. But you also got to look at their situation. I've seen way too many salespeople that are making $100,000 a year. and their, their performance is kind of, yeah, it's milk toast. It's not good. There may be 60% of plan, 50% of plan. But see, the problem is you got to look at their personal side. They're happy at that level. That's the money I need to make. But I'm not working too hard. I'm having a good time. So right, right. is that the person you want to try to develop? Heck no, because you guess right. what? He's not going to or she. It's not going to do that. <laughs> right. You got to think about that. So you kind of have to, you know, to motivate him, you also want to understand their personal life and their personal styles. I use a, a product. I was just certified through through this uh, pandemic. Uh, I became certified on predictive index because I can see what motivates people and what their style is. And and uh, I, I've hired him for a client. We hired a 26-year-old young man. And money doesn't motivate this person. You know, how he helps people. That's what motivates him. So totally out of my world, because that's not what I do. Mean. Right, that's right. Okay. But I, when I talk to him, I talk about how much he's helping people and what an impact he's making. And that's that just makes the world a difference. If I just talk to him about money all the time, man, you make that say you're going to do this. He's, he just, he wouldn't even care. I mean, he might. He's not married yet. When he gets married, he might. <laughs> But right now, he wants to know how he's helping. And that's and that's another thing about the age and millennials and who you're talking to, right? You've got to understand what's important to those guys. Millennials aren't wired like I am or you, most, you know, our, our age. Right, that's right. Okay. That's great. You have to embrace it, understand it, and then just use it. But yeah, motivating salespeople, you just, just make them part of the team. And you got to have that sales culture at the ownership level, right? If they treat them with contempt, it's a problem. I mean, you just, you know, these salespeople don't do anything. They just take people golfing and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I mean, it's all of it's as bad now as it used to be, but you still see it and it's, it's not good. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's a great point you make about really uh, making sure those top salespeople are happy because you do not want to lose them. Um, right. And, uh, and I think sometimes that happens in, in certain environments and that's a shame. Sure. sure. Well, well I, I thank you very much for spending some time with us and talking sales. How can we uh, learn more about you? Where can we go to uh, to contact you and learn more about uh, how you can help? Okay. My email is mmetz at optimussales.com. That's spelled O-P-T-I-M-U-S-S-L-E-S.com. You can call my cell. I mean, I'm always running and my mind's always going. So that's 618. 600-647. And then I also have a website at optimussales.com if you want to go there. Simple. But yeah, I'm always happy to talk sales. Um, you know, reach out. I'll put you on my, I have a monthly newsletter and it's about education. Just like I said, it's, here are some tips. I think this one's about uh, building sales plans and what's the effective way. And there's always something downloadable of giving you a tool set, you know, you know giving you things. I've been told that I tell too much, give too much information away for free. And I'm like, guys, if I can have a 30 minute hour conversation with a person, a customer or a client and fix their sales in 30 minutes to an hour, I don't want to, I don't want them to. Do it. <laughs> I love it. Really well, that, that's help. fantastic. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, thanks again, Mark. Um, appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thanks for, for a great discussion. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. And good to see you again. <laughs>